<laughs> well, thanks for joining us. You're in your home in South Florida, looking like it's a lovely day. Um, uh, there's uh, folks from all across the world who are joining us. I was looking at the comments just a moment ago. Dora Lease, she said in the G Plus event comment section that she's looking forward to the webinar. She's trying to come away with this with the skills to organize her emotional thought life like that of her color-coded closet. Ooh, I <laughs> like that. Good analogy there. <laughs> Mark and Laura Tong are back for another webinar all the way from France. Hey, Mark and Laura. We have Hello. Leah in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia and all kinds of folks from all over the place. Uh, well, I feel like I need to introduce myself at least for the folks who aren't uh, aware of me or don't know my deal. I'm Joel Zaslowski. And uh, I'm just so stoked to be hosting this uh, Simple Rev webinar with Mark and Angel. I am the founder of this thing called Simple Rev, which I'll talk about a little bit towards the end of things. Uh, but for the most part, I have a website called Value Simple, where I help people simplify and build community. And that's really what I'm all about these days, is the intersection of simplicity and community. If I can get those two of them together in any kind of cool way, it's always a wonderful thing. Mark and Angel, I know most people already know you and they're here for you, but I'll give you an opportunity. Would you like to uh, give yourselves a little intro as well? Sure. Yeah. I'm Mark. And I'm Angel. <laughs> and you can find us online at markandangel.com. That's our little home on the web. Um, and we primarily, we cover a lot of topics, but our topics are very focused on overcoming adversity and overcoming the thoughts that get in our way. So basically, we, we look at the psychology of happiness and the psychology of success and what, what it takes to overcome adversities and not just major life tragedies, but just, just you know, th those major life tragedies and the little encounters that bring us down on a day-to-day -day basis, how to get beyond them, how to work through them, how to think properly through them, and make sure that we're kind of moving in the right direction without letting unnecessary stress and unnecessary negativity get the best of us. Yeah, unnecessary stress, negativity, overcoming adversity. That's, <laughs> uh, that's a, a great segue into this webinar. So we came up with this ahead of time and we thought, hey, what should we name this thing that we're gonna do together? And we thought three key steps to stop the thoughts that complicate your life. And there's a number of things that we intend to, to do, to present and to engage people on, but just a few housekeeping items real quick. So our goals for this webinar help you, and this is Mark and Angel, this is your sweet spot. So one of the reasons I'm so excited. So help you recognize your untrue thoughts, practicing self-compassion, stopping inner pressure or outer negativity from giving you that simple, more intentional life, uh, and probably some more grooviness that we'll explore together. And as far as the concrete things, so that people have an expectation in terms of some of the topics that we're gonna cover, uh, we're gonna be talking about how to turn your thoughts from a random obstacle course into an intentional landscape. Uh, a couple of steps, Angel, this is you, that you need to simplify anything in your life. Uh, Self-compassion, that, at least these days, is not optional, assuming that you wanna be healthy and productive. We'll cover that a little bit. Uh, how to maintain solid mental and emotional hygiene and why a daily self-inquiry practice leads to major self-awareness. And towards the tail end, we'll be looking at questions that you send in in real time, but we're gonna field some questions uh, towards the end of our 60 minutes together, and we'll sprinkle them in as we go. Uh, of course, we're for you, the participant, the folks who are watching us, thank you. We're grateful that you're with us. We'll be asking you questions along the way, and giving you plenty of opportunity to connect with your fellow webinar participants in the comments you can do that on the Google Plus event page or with tweets to at simple underscore REV. You can use the hashtag simple rev other places. Um, basically, we want you to feel like you are engaging us, but we also realize a lot of the benefit here is you engaging your fellow participants, which you can do through the Google Plus event page. Uh, you can also, there's one more thing, there's a Q&A feature right below the video on the Google Plus event page. There's a little thing that says Q&A. And if you click that, you can log a question for us to address as we go through or for us to cover towards the tail end when we get into the questions and answers section. So that leads us into our first topic. And this, it was hard keeping it to just three, which is what we, we wanted to go deep on some things. And we thought, okay, where's a good place to start with the mindset? And we thought, are your thoughts a random obstacle course? 
or an intentional landscape. Mark and Angel, uh, I guess I want to start with you two. Before we get into it too much, when you wake up in the morning, like when you woke up this morning, I know that oftentimes you have a specific intention. And to stop living inside your head so much, start living in your body more. Just for starters, is it okay if our mind is constantly in motion, if that motion is supporting the kind? You want to start this one? Or you want to... Well, I, I think, you know, Angel and I are very intentional when we wake up. I think that, um, you know, well begun is half done, right? That's a good cliche, but it's, it's so true. So, I mean, starting, starting your day off on a present, in, with, a, with a present intentional mindset, really, it builds the foundation for everything that's coming after it. Mm -hmm. And so Angel and I are really focused on starting the day with a short meditation practice. Um, she does a little bit more traditional meditation. I focus a little bit more on gratitude meditation. Um, but the goal really is to not really eliminate thoughts, but to bring the right thoughts to the forefront. And those, those, those thoughts really should be on what do I want to accomplish today? What am I trying to pay attention to now? Right? There's all these goals that, you know, out there in the future, and certainly they're necessary and we need to be striving for them. There's things that have happened in the past that alter what we know and how we feel, but that doesn't need to be the primary focal point. The key is to kind of eliminate some of that noise so that we can be more focused and more intentional about what we're doing today, what we're doing right now. Eliminating noise, I guess that's subjective in some ways. One person's noise is another person's signal. But identifying what's important, I guess that's the important part of everything because thoughts are shaping our reality. Angel, maybe you can just chime in real quick on this one. So this being in tune, self-aware, having this practice, whether it's through meditation or otherwise, of self-inquiry, can you tell, how do you practice this self-inquiry where you're constantly assessing and looking inside of yourself, trying to figure out what's important to me right now for my life? Yeah, um, I, I think we can, we can all notice that our thoughts can snowball and take over our life. One, one small thought can just consume us. Um, so one way that we like to manage our thoughts is we have these questions that we ask ourselves in terms of self-inquiry. Um, the first one is, is it true? So as I'm having thoughts and, you know, I'm dwelling on this one, uh, I ask myself, well, is this thought true? Right. And can it be proven too? Like we, we love to do that. Is it true? And is it proven? Like, can it, is it something that can be proven? Um, so I mean, what's an example, like something that, that often kind of pops into your head? Um, for, I mean, it depends at, at any moment. Um, like, like I know one that we, we all constantly struggle with, right? Is, is like, I'm not good enough, right? That, that like fear of failure, that fear of, you know, it doesn't have to be catastrophic failure, but it's just like, I'm not good enough yet. I don't know enough yet to get from point A to point B mm -hmm. to get where I want to go. And that, it's like that constant, like, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. So you stop and you say, like Angel said it, is it, is it true? true? Can it be proven that I'm not going to make it right now? Well, what's the reality of it? How far have I come? Right? The reality is I've, I've come, I'm not where I used to be. So obviously I'm making some kind of progress. Changes are happening. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, that, that can help disarm. It, that question is not a, a right or wrong. Is it true? It's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be a yes or a no. It's just about opening, broadening your perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, can this really be proven, this thought that's stopping me in my tracks? And most of the time when you say, is it true? We're going to think, yes, heck yeah, it's true. But then when you're like, can it be proven? When you ask yourself, can it be proven? Can I be 100% that it's true? Then it starts making you think, hmm, you know, is it true that I'm not good enough? Yeah. So, I mean, I think to preface this too, it would be good to say that one of the practices we highly, highly recommend as it relates to self-inquiry, which is basically just asking yourself a series of questions mm -hmm. that allow you to evaluate your own thoughts. Because if, if you were to go see a psychologist, a, a counselor on a regular basis, let's say it's bi-weekly, I mean, generally what they're going to do is they're going to sit you down and they're going to ask you a series of very focused questions. They're going to record your responses on these, these questions. And then the next week when you go back, they're going to reiterate some of the things that you said. They're going to twist those questions around slightly. And the idea is just to broaden your perspective, to, to kind of open up your mind to what's really going on mm -hmm. in your head. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the way you can do this for yourself is self-inquiry. 
asking yourself questions and judging yourself based on, not really judging, that's the wrong word, evaluating what's going on in your head. And there's two parts to this. Mm -hmm. So even before you ask the questions, one of the keys that we found is to actually record your thoughts. So you have, when you are feeling anxiety, when you are feeling negativity knocking at the back of your head, when there's that self-defeating thought, I'm not going to make it, I'm not good enough, creeping up on you. If you can take 60 seconds and literally just do a brain dump, literally a paragraph of raw thought down on paper or in an iPad or an iPhone, just get it out of your head and write it down. This is exactly what I'm feeling right now. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm going to be good enough for these people. I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm stumbling. I, whatever it is that's in your head, get it down. And the reason we say write it down is because we are great. As human beings, we're great at talking ourselves out of the way we felt later on. So Angel might feel this way. And then, you know, you go back a day, day or two later about and, and think about the way you thought when that anxiety was going, when your emotions were really raging. And, and I'll tell myself, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, it was just this thought. But I'm in a better place now. It wasn't that big of a deal. It was no big deal. Yeah. It was no big deal which is not necessarily true because in that moment, it was a huge deal with how you were re responding to a situation, how effective you were, and how, how you were able to communicate your points, how you were able to actually get a job done. So it was extremely important in that short time frame. So that's why when you're in that time frame, you record it. So you got that raw data down. Now, when you're, you know, at that, that evening, two days later, a week later, it really doesn't matter. The idea is to collect your thoughts when you're, when you're feeling emotional, and then when you have some time, and you're feeling collected, go back, open up that journal or that iPad or wherever you stored those thoughts, and then apply the self-inquiry to them. Read the thought. Okay, you know, I, 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 I'm not good enough because X, Y, Z, blah, blah. You know, and there it is. And, and you're reading that thought and you're thinking, gosh, that's how I really felt in that moment. And, and certainly some emotions are going to start stirring in mm -hmm. your head when you do that. And then you ask yourself, and then from there, is, that's when you ask yourself these questions. So the first one being, is it true? Can it be proven? Is it 100% true? And then when you start analyzing that question, and you know, and again, like Mark said, it's not a right or wrong answer. It's to open your perspective. It's to open your mind. So after you answer that question, the second question is, is who am I when I have that thought going through my mind? Mm -hmm. Right? How does that thought make me behave? How do I treat myself? How do I treat others? How do I treat the situation? How do I treat any situation for that matter? When I have that thought going through my head, I'm not good enough. Well, if I'm not good enough for anything, right? I mean, how can I possibly accomplish what I need to accomplish? How can I feel in a state of mind that's actually capable of taking a step forward? So, I mean, so who am I with that thought in my head? And that, I mean, that opens the door to, to, I mean, suddenly you're sitting there, my gosh, you know, who I am with the thought that I'm not good enough is a human being who actually isn't the best they can be because they're telling themselves that. For If for no other reason, it's just that, that you're simply telling yourself you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. and, and the third question is? The third question is, who would I be or what would I see without this thought? So if you were to erase the thought altogether, for example, I'm not good enough, who would you see then? I would see someone that's trying hard, that's doing my best. but that, Someone who's made progress. Mm -hmm. This question is very powerful. Who would you be without that thought? So if you really start asking yourself this question, who would I be without this thought? And then whichever thought is constantly going through your mind or whatever thought you're going over in your journal at this particular moment, it can really be a game changer. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing is it really opens your mind to, once again, there's no right or wrong here, but who would I be without this thought? You know, like Angel said, what else would I see? You know, if, if for instance, you know, so if somebody was really bothering you, if, if there was somebody that was really just spewing um, what you believe to, to be negative emotions towards you, and you, you, you got a bad feeling once, and then you got a bad feeling twice, and now every time you see them, they bother you, right? Even though maybe they've changed. A year's time could have passed, two years' time could have passed, and you still have this idea in your head that this person is negative, this person's not right for me. That's if, if you enter into to any communication with them with the thought in your head that that's who that person is, 
then naturally you're going to treat them a certain way. The entire conversation is going to go right downhill. And we're all guilty of this. Of course. I, I know. I, oh, yeah. you know. Angel and I, too. That's, that's something important to say. Angel yes. and I practice this on a regular basis ourselves, just like our gratitude meditation, just like everything we recommend. These are practices that we are constantly engaged in because we're all human, mm -hmm. right? I mean, none of us are, are above this. This is something that na we naturally are struggling with always, all of us. And just to give you a personal example, I have a younger sister and I used to think she was the most selfish person in the entire world. It was always her way or the highway. So, you know, I, I went through these questions with myself. Is it true? Well, yes, it's true. My sister's selfish. I know she's selfish. Um, so in that, that really didn't budge me at all. Um, how do I feel when I think that my sister is selfish? Well, I get angry. I get tensed when I'm around her. I get stressed out. Um, just annoyed all around annoyed i know when she comes over it's going to be her way or the highway she you know she's not going to listen to anyone else and then the next question was so who would i be if i didn't think my sister was selfish who would i see if i didn't think my sister was selfish so if i took away that thought that my sister was selfish all of a sudden i saw a beautiful girl who has great ideas who's caring who's compassionate and i was letting that one thought take over everything that I saw of my sister. Mm -hmm. And so, so the experience, yeah, the experience doesn't change, mm -hmm. but the way that you're experiencing that experience, not to get too meta here, is completely different based on that reflection that you're doing. Well, this, this is actually, like you're saying, I have a meditation practice that I do. I do gratitude rituals throughout the day. Some of it helps, sometimes it doesn't. Like there are times where it just seems like there's this mental parade with a high stepping, hard landing marching band just playing the song over and over again about oh, I'm not good enough to do this kind of work or be friends with this kind of person I'm not capable of starting achieving some kind of big project let's actually let's turn it over to our participants here for a moment and I just want to get their perspective on something real quick there's a there's a great quote of uh, raptitude David Kane uh, and I'd like people to reflect on this Thoughts are a little like politicians, experts at rhetoric, sensationalism, self-preservation, unlimited in number, mostly just noisy and useless, but occasionally make important things happen. It'd be fun to see people reflect on that comment real quick. Angel, Mark, do either of you two have anything that you want to reflect on when you read those words? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that it's like that, that balance. You, you do have to find that balance where you're not so focused on what's going on around you that you forget about what you're actually doing, being present with what, what your hands can work on, what your mind can work on in the moment. But at the same time, you know, not have, leaving, leaving space, leaving some structured space for creativity, for brainstorming, for, you know, because I, I, I think that's one of the things that if you're just focused, you know, right in front of you, you're not leaving yourself the space to necessarily be creative with uh, big ideas. So there's got to be, it's really about separating the, the contemplation of big ideas and goals, but then not keeping those big ideas and goals as the focal point on the day-to-day -day basis when you're actually pursuing and, and going through the journey, going through the steps. Because if you are constantly thinking about the big goal you have to achieve, then you are not going to be present on the steps you're taking today. And in, in a backwards way, that's going to make you feel not good enough, right? Because obviously you haven't achieved the goal. And if the goal is all that's on your mind, then, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough today because I haven't achieved that goal. So it's, be, it's realizing that there's two separate, you know, two totally separate entities here. There's the things we want to achieve, the goals we're, we're striving for, the, 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 the meanings that we're, we're, we're moving towards, and then there's the daily rituals that we carry out that get us there. And that on a day-to-day -day basis, the primary focus, 95% of our focus should be on that daily ritual, on being present, on going through these, these focused, mindful motions, um, but still leaving that 5% at least to contemplate the bigger picture. Yeah, well, speaking of the bigger picture, so we've been talking big picture right now at the 30,000 foot looking down, not upon the world, but upon ourselves, which is a great place to start for a lot of points in the day. Let's, let's bring it down to a somewhat lower level, maybe 5,000 feet, 2,000 feet. We'll leave okay. it up to people. 
Um, so the second thing that we want to talk about is how to maintain solid mental and emotional hygiene. And I know you two know me. For other people, if, if they know me as well, it probably doesn't surprise you. And I put this in the worksheet that we gave to people before the webinar started. Uh, there's a guy, Guy Winch, and he talks about if you get cut on your arm, you wouldn't decide, hey, I know, I'm going to take a knife and I'm going to see how much deeper I can make this cut. That would be a ridiculous idea to physically make this cut on your arm larger. Yet that's exactly what I and billions of other people do every day with mental and emotional injuries that they have. And sometimes I think, and you've probably thought about it too, in terms of brain hygiene, how we do that. So if you register for this webinar via email and you have your worksheet handy, it would be great to know what you commented on um, in the Google Plus comments or on Twitter. But um, for, for the two of you, it's, it's just, I guess, what kind of systems or habits have you two built to promote proper mental and emotional hygiene? Let's start there. Sure. Well, I mean, we, we mentioned my gratitude meditation mm -hmm. already. So Angel usually does a little bit more traditional meditation. I'll let you talk on that in a second. Um, but gratitude meditation, so the, the, the idea of literally meditating, thinking about, focusing your thoughts on what you're grateful for once a day has scientifically been proven by many psychologists that simply reviewing what you have to be grateful for absolutely improves your happiness. So, I mean, there, there has been studies where there's, you know, two focus groups, one group is just a control group and the other group once a day are focus are, are, are required to basically list three things that they were grateful for that happened today. It doesn't have to be big things, just really small wins. And after, you know, a month, six months down the road, they were measurably happier than the control group. So, I mean, I, I had read books years ago about this and I just started implementing this in my life. Angel does it with me. Um, I, I do it a lot on my own. Um, it's just something I, I do every day and it's made a world of difference. It really makes, it opens my eyes to the little wins that are so easily forgotten, that are so often overlooked. And that makes me feel great going into the day. It really does. And like you mentioned, emotional and mental hygiene is extremely important because if we're stressed out on the inside, we're gonna be, we're gonna spew that out to everyone else. So it's very important. Um, one thing like, one thing I like to do is I like to get up early. So I set my alarm for 5 a.m. And I like to get up early before my 13 month old son and before Mark and just have that quietness and be able to wake up, grab some coffee and sit down and just meditate and just listen to my breath. And so for me, that is very important um, because I notice on the days that I don't do that and then you get up and it's like, I, as I'm sure a lot of our listeners can experience when you get up in the morning and it's just go 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 go. That emotional and mental hygiene is not, is not is not good. It, it's just chaos and it, it's just not structured. And so for me, really having that time to myself in the morning to breathe, to meditate, to have a slow, calm start is beneficial for me. Yeah, I mean, I think you and I actually noticed a while back. Um, this is going back several years, but one of the things that got us very interested in being having a mindfulness based morning, having a morning that was structured around meditation, was that we noticed we were actually waking up and reaching for our smartphones before we even kissed each other, okay? And this was before we had a son. But we were literally waking up and checking emails and social media before we actually had a conversation, before we even looked at each other and acknowledged each other. And we sat down and we're like, you know, I mean, that, what is that doing for the rest of our day? We're starting the day, like Angel said, helter-skelter, and our minds are not focused on anything specific. Like, and it, it's just that that carried through the entire day. The rest of the day kind of carried that helter skelter, you know, mentality because that's what we were starting with. We were laying the foundation improperly. So, yeah, I mean, the meditation practice, waking up early. You know, not everyone's an you know an early riser. Um, I don't think that you have to absolutely practice this first thing in the morning. It's been very beneficial for us. But for the for you know the night owls. Take some time yeah. at night to do the same thing. You can do a gratitude meditation at night. You can focus on yourself. You can think about your next day the night before and really get yourself start, like get yourself set up the night before so that when you wake up, even if things, you know, even if the kids are running, running around the house and, you know, the fire alarms are going off, you've already thought about what's important yeah. for the next day. So you can, you can circumvent some of that just by going back to your list. Okay, yeah. this is 
this was my plan for the well, day. Well, and even just having a calm evening, if that means watching no TV for the last hour before you go to bed and doing something you enjoy reading and listening to your breath. So, but yeah, but you can do it in the morning or in the evening. It's just having that time to yourself. Yeah. And I think, you know, this kind of reminds me of this, this little story, this analogy that, you, that, that uh, angels the work. The orange story? Yeah. Did you want to tell that? You want me to tell it? Sure. So, well, I can tell it. So if I had an orange right here with me and I squeezed it, what would come out of it? Joel. Oh, pulp, orange juice. I feel like this is maybe a trick question. You're yeah, in Florida. Orange, too. Orange, so you okay, have tons of oranges. Orange. Can you just show us? <laughs> you grab an orange and can you do it? Let me go get the juice there real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. Or, or, obviously, orange, orange juice, juice would come out. So okay. why wouldn't apple juice come out? Right, apples to oranges. Well, well so apple apple juice wouldn't come out because obviously. You're squeezing an orange, right? So, so what's inside is an orange. So when you squeeze it, orange juice would come out. Mm -hmm. So now imagine instead of thinking about the orange that you're thinking about yourself. So if people squeeze me, if people put pressure on me, what comes out? So if I constantly have someone squeezing me, whether it's my mother, my sister, Mark. Any stress factor at all. Any really. stress factor. What what's going to come out of me? And that and that 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 right there, that question, what is going to come out of you, is is the entire principle, it's the entire point behind why we must be mindful, why well, we must be more present. Because whatever is inside, whatever is inside, when in the moment you get squeezed, just like the orange juice is coming through the orange's skin, whatever when you get squeezed, whatever is inside is coming through your skin. And if it's anything other than love then you realize you have some work to do, that you need to release some of the negativity around you. If it's anything other than love, then you've got some changes you have to do. It's because it's your choice. It's your choice to spew. What, what's inside of you is your choice and it, you're making the decisions on what's gonna come out. So yeah. it, it really is, like if, if it's not love, then maybe you got to look around yourself and say, okay, w ask yourself those, those self-inquiry questions. You know, what, what's causing this negativity? What are the, what thoughts am I constantly thinking out that's spewing this negativity? You know, what are the sources within myself? You know, and I think, you know, and, and those, those self-inquiry questions, once again, this is not something like you, you use those three questions, you, 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 you record, you review, you go through the questions, you think about it, you're opening your mind to different perspectives. This isn't going to change your behavior and your thought process overnight. It's not like you're going to read this once and go, I'm fixed, right? This is a ritual. We, we, we sort of touched on rituals. This is something you do every day for years potentially, but you'll likely see the results within a couple months. It's a ritual to change your identity. And I, I'm seeing some, there's some great questions. Kelly, AJ, Amy, they're, okay. they're coming through. We're going to get to some questions in a little bit. But okay. what I hear you two saying is it's about crafting an identity. The reason why is it helps your identity throughout the course of the day be congruent with the self-image that you have as somebody who's loving, who's compassionate, who's mindful, kind, patient. And that's the reason why I do it in the morning too. Um, it's great to do any of these self-inquiry practices or mindfulness practices at any point in time. I kind of think real quick in terms of how we identify ourselves, it influences every single assumption that we have from our intelligence, how smart we are, our mental stability, are we stable, how well are we generally speaking, because I don't know about you two, but like at one point in my life, I just thought that I was naturally uh, non, not a creative person. That was the story that I told myself, and so I didn't have any creativity. At one point, I thought I was just kind of generally sick. So how likely is it that I'll ever be able to truly thrive when I have this self-identity as somebody who's sick? If I don't have self-discipline, how many areas is that going to play out in my life? So on the, on the converse, though, these positive identities that you do through your rituals and through your self-inquiry, those are also self-reinforcing. And that's the empowering part about it in terms of what I hear from you. I want to make sure that we get some time to chat about our third topic, but um, just so first of all, we talked about the thoughts, randomness into more intentional. We're talking about emotional hygiene, 
And I'm reminded, and you two maybe just want to comment on this real quick, Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz, there's a great book that I've read called The Power of Full Engagement. And there's a quote in there that I love, which is, if the truth is to set us free, facing it cannot be a one-time event. It must be a practice. It must be a ritual. Like muscles, self-awareness withers from disuse and deepens when we push past our resistance to see more of our truth. Can you two, just maybe in a minute or so, you know, pushing past that resistance, that awkwardness, that discomfort that you have in trying to see your truth, have you two uh, had some kind of strategy or just a little switch that flipped that allowed you to do that more? I think, I think you know, it's so funny. Everyone's looking for the fix to that, and, and the fix is the daily practice. And it's doing. And with the daily practice, though, it's little steps, small. Tiny steps, tiny, tiny rituals. Yeah, I, you, you, I want to write a book, right? So I, I tell myself, this is you know, a few years ago, before our, our book, A Thousand Little Things, came out. We were, we were talking about the idea of writing a book, and we, we said, you know, we, we want this to be a highlight of some of our greatest articles. And we were thinking, oh my gosh, you know, at, at the time, we didn't actually have all those articles written. So it was like we were thinking, my goodness, uh, to, to write you know, a 100,000-word book or a 75,000-word book, it sounds like an impossible feat. But the interesting thing is, is Angel and I have been writing two articles that are all between, I'd say between a thousand words and two thousand words, mm -hmm. twice a week, for years, for a decade. And when you look at that and you say, okay, so the ritual, the ritual is that every week, every day really, I try to sit down and write at least 500 words. That's not, that's, you know, now that might sound like a lot to some people, it might sound like a little bit to others. For me, that's very comfortable to sit down every single day and write at least 500 words. When I do that every single day, in a year's time, I have the book. The mm -hmm. book's written, you know? And, and, and that's the interesting thing is if I think about writing a book, it sounds like a, a, a it sounds, mm -hmm. that's not unachievable, but it, to some people it would sound unachievable, mm -hmm. but it sounds like a very difficult, stressful task. Yes. But when I think about waking up every day and writing what I feel comfortable with, which is f about 500 words, and if I get to 1,000, great. If I'm feeling really bad that day and I can only write 100, I write the 100. Mm -hmm. What I don't do is not write. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the key. So, so going back to the tiny ritual, the idea is every day work a little bit on, on whatever it is you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And, it, and, and if, if, if five minutes isn't, is, is too much, do it for two minutes. And if it's a fear, start small. Like our biggest growth opportunity comes from facing our fears. Like once you get to that that moment, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm here. How did I ever get here? So facing your fear, but in like small steps. An analogy that came to mind as you were talking is like, for example, a basketball team. They want to win the championship. Okay, they want to win the championship. So they have this goal at the beginning of the season. I'm going to get to the finals. I'm going to win the championship. But you can't, that can't be the goal. That that can be the goal, but where does that get you if you think about it every every day? Well, it's not going to get you there. What's going to get you there is the ritual. The ritual of the training. The, I'm going to practice. Players. I'm going to practice Monday through Friday. I'm going to practice today. And then I'm going to practice again tomorrow. And I'm going to practice my free throw. And if you took away the goal completely of I want to get the championship, but you did the ritual you'd be pretty, pretty close to hitting that goal without even thinking about it just by implementing that daily ritual. Yeah, you would. Well, you're giving people some cool mental imagery. I think we started with the orange, and now you're on this bigger orange basketball. I think anytime somebody sees the orange, we, we like analogies. <laughs> we, we like spherical objects, apparently. <laughs> apparently so. We want people to squeeze it. I'm, I'm just looking here. Speaking of squeezing, Marion in the comments on the Google Plus event page, she said, just got squeezed. What came out of me? love flowed that's really cool hopefully we can all be there or get there yeah uh, let's talk a little bit about simplifying and how your thoughts and habits can simplify your life angel if we could start with you this time there's a great blog post that you wrote on your website a while back about and you said there's only two steps to simplifying and this ties into what we we're talking about uh, at the top of our webinar so these two steps to simplifying identify what's most important to you and eliminate everything else. So if we go with that approach for a moment, identifying what's most important to you and eliminating everything else, what are the types of thoughts or the specific thoughts that are most important to you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that changes daily. 
depending on what your goals are and what your idea of the day is. So like, for example, for me, the thoughts, well, first of all, the thoughts are, you want to keep them as positive as possible. Um, but especially like today, my thoughts today was I am excited about doing this webinar. I'm excited about getting on here, talking to Joel, having this conversation, having our readers and audience there. And so I kind of let everything else go. I kind of said, okay, I'm not worrying about, you know, other things we've got going on today. I, I'm excited about this simple rev little conversation we have here. And then I'm going to go from there. So I really think one thing that Mark and I like to talk a lot about is a lot of what's stressing us out is thinking about the past or thinking about the future. So it's really about being present and what does this day have in store for me and being excited about that and taking it day by day. Yeah, I think anybody can fight the battles of just one day, right? doesn't matter whether we've got a lot of chaotic, you know, obligations today or whether um, there's something stressful happened. It's like we can always fight the battles of today. And I agree with Angel entirely. It's as soon as you add the infinite battles of yesterday and tomorrow that things get overly complicated. Um, and I, I love what you're saying too. I mean, the idea of focus on what's more, most important, eliminate everything else. You know, it, it's about, it's not so much about focusing on specific thoughts when you wake up as it is about removing the thoughts that don't need to be there yeah. by being present with what you're actually doing that day. Waking up every morning and deciding, you know, if I could wipe everything off my plate, what would I put back on mm -hmm. my plate? And I think that Mark makes a great point. So I think it's hard to pinpoint like what's one specific thought that I'm going to focus on today, but rather what's go what thoughts are going through my mind right now that I just need to, to get out, get out of my mind. Like they're not making any progress. They're not helping me at, in this moment. Let me take yeah. those thoughts and just erase them for the time being. Yeah, I think because a lot of the times it's not so much most people's problem. A lot of people know sort of what they want. They at least have some, some idea about what, they generally want and, that, and that's not really what's defeating them is not knowing that what's defeating them is all those other that that noise we talked about that's going on in their head all those other thoughts which are usually associated with another mm -hmm. time and place that's weighing you down that are weighing you down right here while you're trying to get done what you what you need to get done the work that's right in front of you so it, it's really like cleaning the plate only putting back onto the plate what you need in this exact moment and going from there and then when that job, when that task is complete, letting it go and starting again, you know, eliminate everything that's not important so that you're left only with what is for each moment, moment to moment. How task, to task is probably an easier way to say it. Task to task. Ta yeah. Moment to moment, task to task. In doing that in real time, I'm having this image, you know, like I'm inside my brain, I'm walking around and I'm seeing, ooh, lovely white space. It's just totally clear in here. I wiped it all free and now I'm just cruising around. Hey, there's something that's cool. There's patience. Oh, hey, there's gratitude. Like I'm just kind of pulling things off the shelves and I'm figuring right now at this moment I need it. But in times where, especially if you're interacting with somebody else, a lot of times when we're inside of our own head, we're telling our stories, we're alone. Can I just, you two are obviously with each other pretty much all the time. It, when it comes to you two and engaging someone else in that conversation, as you have this input that's coming at you, whether it's conversation or whether you're watching a video or a webinar, is there a way that even when you have stimulus that's just constantly flowing at you, that you can just be wiping it clear, relatively clear again and again? Is that a, is that a goal we should have? I think, yeah, I think focus. I think when you're talking to somebody, actually paying attention to them, sitting down, turning off the phone, Closing the laptop, you know, turning off the screen, <laughs> getting into it, getting getting to a quiet area where where you can eliminate some of those distractions mm -hmm. is extremely important. I think you know that's huge nowadays. Where we sit down with people, we're sitting at a table, eating lunch, and everyone's got their their smartphone out, right? You see it every single day. So yeah, I mean, being being mindful about those distractions and focusing on the conversation, yeah, yeah focusing on the person, but in listening. You know, not waiting to speak, like actually taking in what the other right. person is Not saying. listening just with the intention to say something, yes. but listening just to listen, just to take it present with that person and saying, yeah, I'm here to, to, to I'm, I'm here to hear what you have to say. And, and that's always, that's 
that's always a challenge for us. You know, we have a million things going on, you know, my kids in the background crying or this, and it's like really trying to be present and be in that conversation. And you know, that time is valuable and enjoying it. Yeah. I mean, and that, that goes like when you bring up kids, you know, I mean, it's, it's, this plays out so well in the household too, where, you know, let's say your, your kid goes into the refrigerator, pulls out the gallon of milk and drops it on the floor, right? Spilling all over the floor. I mean, it's easy to run over there in a frantic, you know, like hasteful mind, scream at your child, pick up the milk, try to wipe it up real quick before you run off and do what you were doing to begin with. And your kid's kind of left there either crying or just upset or just, you know, oh, I guess mom handled that, you know, and just kind of confused. And, 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 you know, when we're busy, a lot of times that's what we do. But if you're more mindful and if you're more present and you're more focused on that communication we're talking about, you can just as easily, same experience, same event happen, just as easily go over there, pick up the jug of milk, put it back into the refrigerator, you know, wipe up the floor for a second, and then sit there with your kid and say, let's try that again. You know, let's, let me show you how to do this. Let, let's, let's go over this one more time. And let your, you let your child take the, take the, the milk back out of the refrigerator and, I think that the the outcome, you know, obviously, what the event is the same, but the outcome is completely different. Mm -hmm. The communication, the love, mm -hmm. I mean, the presence, not letting something simple like get in your way. You know, it, we have enough time to do that. So often we think we don't have time. It's like, oh, I don't have time to explain that right now because I'm busy rushing over here. Well, you do have time. You you have the time. And, and half of it is is making sure that you schedule your life your life i mean this goes back to taking everything else out focus on what's the most, most important remove the rest don't have so many obligations every single day that you feel like you don't have the time to spend when something small like that happens because that's not the truth you're choosing to do other things and running around you do have the time and you should make the time because that stuff's important those small conversations i just want to build on that real quick just having the time to call time out especially when you have children and there's some people who are commenting and Angel appreciating your perspective from a parent's view. Now, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and it's important to me to give my kids the opportunity to say, hey, I handled that wrong, mm -hmm. do over. Mm -hmm. And I do that every once in a while, too. Like, if there's milk that's spilled, and if I'm a little bit too snappy, I'm a little bit too stressed, then every once in a while to Grant and Clark, I'll say, hey, you know what, guys? I handled that wrong. Can I have a do-over? Yeah. And I can do that with not just with the things that happen in my physical environment. You can also, when it comes to your thoughts, you think something, you don't want it to be there. Just, hey, can I have a do-over on that? Can I try to process this differently? Can I try to look at it differently? And a, a lot of it goes, we're going to get into uh, some questions in just a few minutes. But as I'm looking at some of the questions that our participants are posing to us, a lot of it falls into this general category of um, there's a fear-based, scarcity-based mentality that a lot of people are commenting on. And then you two have commented about it, and I've read it other places, this abundance mindset where you're removing the excess and you're focusing on just what's important. And a lot of it is in terms of being satisfied with anything, with our relationships, our money, our stuff, our thoughts, we need to be okay with being satisfied with less. And we don't need to necessarily hoard it, whether it's um, an unnecessary thought or whether it's a relationship that's not doing us any good. As far as the abundance mindset goes, because you two have it, like you're expressing it right now, you're practically radiating in terms of everything around me is abundant. Uh, can you use that in some specific way to simplify your life by seeing the world as this abundant place as opposed to fearful and everything is scarce? Yeah. I mean, uh, the obvious is, is if we're, we're always wanting more, 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 then we're never going to have enough. Because even when we have more, we're going to want more. So if the goal is always to have more, we'll never, we'll never be happy. We'll never get there, right? Um, I, I think we're really touching on some of the basis of, of mindfulness, really, which is you know, taking, taking a deep breath, looking around you, appreciating what's there without holding on so tight that you think it'll never change, right? You have to appreciate what's there without not wanting it to change because it will. And when things aren't going well, when that milk spills on the floor, you have to be equally as mindful to know that, okay, this has occurred and this, there's a, a situation here that I have to address, but it won't always be this way. You know, and, and so, I mean, I think that's really the basis. It's, it's like giving yourself enough space, enough mental space 
to appreciate what's there without mm -hmm. holding on too tight. Mm -hmm. And then when things, you know, when the natural, you know, challenges arise, not coming from it from that fear-based mindset mm -hmm. of this is the way it's always going to be because things are always changing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's never going to be that good forever and it's never going to be that bad forever. It's a constant, you know, it's an oscillating constantly. That's how our life life works. Yeah, and I understanding just, that. I think so many times we we get restricted with ourselves like this is this is all I have available to me. This is all I can do. My situation is never going to change. And like Mark said, and you said, having an abundance mindset is knowing that the opportunities and possibilities are endless. And so at any given point, you can change your circumstances. You can change your thoughts. Yeah. And, and, and so that's, that's what's huge about presence. Like you have the, um, you know, the, the type A mentality that, well, if you're so present and you're so mindful, then I'm not going to be focused on getting things done. I'm not going to be out there getting the tasks done that need to get done. And the ch my challenge to that is that, you know, when you're in that helter skelter mindset, getting things done as fast as you can, you're not necessarily getting them done as smart as you can. You're not getting them done to the best of your ability. So the point in mindfulness and taking that deep breath and appreciating the moment and being here, giving yourself that space is not to stay in that peaceful state of mind where you're just, oh, I've got nothing but space and I'm just sitting here looking around. That's not the key. That, you're doing that for a moment to collect yourself, to, to kind of appreciate what's going on, to realize that this is a fleeting moment and I'm here in it, right? And I'm, and I'm embracing it. I'm accepting it. Once you've got that state of mind down, you're in a better position. You're in a better emotional state to take action. You're laying the foundation for being the best that you can be. So it's not that you're staying in this present mindset forever. You're, you're getting into the present mindset so that from that present mindset, you can take action and you can take legitimate, focused, effective action. That's huge. Actually, let's, let's hear, uh, I want to see what our participants are thinking as far as taking action. So based on what we've just been talking about for the last few minutes, uh, it would be really cool whether it's on the Google Plus event page for a tweet to Simple Rev, what for everyone who's watching and engaging us right now, what's one step you can take today to strengthen your abundance mindset? And Mark and Angel, as you two were talking about earlier, like it could be tiny. It could be something that is seemingly so ridiculously small that it would be preposterous that you didn't do that thing. But it'd be great to know for everybody what that one little step is to strengthen that abundance mindset. And I know uh, we just wanted to talk about it real quick. As, you know this webinar and uh, the fact that we're all together and we're, we're smiling we're feeling a lot of gratitude for each other and simple rev and what we're doing here whether it's through webinars or through our events or through our simple rev local I just want to talk about it real quick because a lot of what we've been discussing is why there are a number of us in a community has come around simple rev last year we had about 55 people in Minneapolis for two days of workshops uh, this year you two, which I'm so, so stoked about, are going to be joining us on October 2nd and 3rd in Minneapolis for our Simple Rev 2015 event. Same spirit and city, all about the crossroads of community and simplicity. We have a different venue, uh, some pure conference elements that are into it. Uh, maybe you two, can you just briefly discuss your role? I mean, the fact that you're doing this webinar is a gift to your community, to our community. What's your role, if you won't mind, real quick, as far as Simple Red 2015 goes? And where's your mindset at? <laughs> we, we really want to show up and, and offer as much value to people as possible, to listen to stories, to tell our side of the story, um, and to really discuss some of the tools and tactics that we've seen work over the last decade with our coaching clients and our course members. Um, try to giving, giving people an opportunity to tell us what they're going through specifically. I and mean, that's one of the things we love about Simple Rev. Angel and I have talked about this. You know, like, you know, we've spoken at South by Southwest before, which is so grandiose and so large that it's hard to even interact with the people who are there. You know, there's just so many things going on. So a small, tight-knit uh, group like, like Simple Rev that we're going to have in Minneapolis October 2nd and 3rd is going to be great because I think it's going to give us so much opportunity to interact. Yeah. We're going to have talks. We're going to have workshops that are a little bit more structured. But then there's going to be a lot of free time for us to sit down in small groups and just sort some of this stuff out, just really kind of get into the weeds of, of people's personal stories and what's going on 
and ideas and tools and tips and tactics that have been kind of proven to help them kind of take take a, a positive action on, on, on all of it. So, and we'll get as much out of it as, as, as anybody else. I, I'm, I'm really excited yeah. to, to, you know, meet you face to face, to, to hang out with Joshua Becker again, who's a great guy, Courtney Carver, who we love. Um, Arnoush Brock and Justin Baker, Arnoush, Charlie yeah, Gilkey, Arnoush. Liz Eric Boudry. There's, oh my goodness. Yeah. We're, we're, yeah, we're super excited to hang out with a great group of people, great participants. We've heard nothing but great things about last year. Um, so we're just really excited to be a part of it and to share. Cool. Well, we've decided to keep it intentionally very small. It's definitely not South by Southwest. <laughs> I've spoken that's very exactly, small. That's what caught our attention, Joel. That got caught our attention right from the beginning. I'm like, he's intentionally keeping it small. He's intentionally keeping it simple. All right, we're there. <laughs> and we don't have a lot of time these days. Obviously, with, with, with a young child, as you know, it gets... It gets crazy schedule-wise, so that's why we, we definitely made the time to do this. Yeah. We're excited well, about it. I just wanted to mention that real quick. And also, for the folks who can't or won't get to Minneapolis for our event, and the vast majority of people can't or won't, which is totally cool, uh, we also are having uh, people host free local what we call Simple Rep gatherings in their area. So if folks want to, if they're digging this Simple Rep thing and they want to bring it to them as opposed to come to us, they can go to simplerev.com slash local and maybe even sign up to uh, host some of these free local gatherings in their area. Uh, let's let's hit some QA for a little bit. What do you say? Should we? There's a lot of groovy questions that I've got here. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. All right. The first one that I have here is uh, from Kelly O'Brien, and she says she wants to hear more about how to stop feeling that way beyond just saying it via thoughts. So what she's talking about is her thoughts are one thing, her feelings are another thing. How does she stop feeling a certain way, a, a type of unhealthy way, as opposed to just telling herself, hey, don't feel that way? Okay. Well, I mean, I'll take it from, you know, this goes back to the process of self-inquiry in the sense that you're not going to change the way you feel immediately. The way you feel is going to change over time as you practice this, as you get more in tune with what's actually going on in your head. Because what's going on in your head is changing the way you feel. So if you can get into that process of self-inquiry, and we will, we will talk a lot more about that at the, the, you know, the main event in Minneapolis, but um, we'll go through it in detail. But that process of, of, of getting in tune with your own thoughts is going to be helpful. Another big one is, is your, you know, the physiology, the, the connection between mind and body. So if you're talking about a quick fix, if you're talking about like, I have anxiety surging, I'm feeling a certain way right now, doing a, like a change of state with your body is, is huge. Simply getting up, stretching, taking a quick walk in, in a green space in nature someplace if it's, if it's readily available to you. I mean, that's been proven time and time again, you know, that getting out in, in just a green space for a short time will make you feel better. Um, so that's huge. Do you have any, any quick ones to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree. Like the, the self inquiry, you can use that for your thoughts, but it is your feelings. It's going to take, it's going to take time. And so another thing you can try doing is just fake it till you make it, you know, put yourself in that happy state. Um, but also still doing the self inquiry, this, the questions and working on that and writing down when you're emotional, record those thoughts when you're emotional and then reviewing them when you're in a better state. And that's going to be an ongoing process. So I just think, you know, trying to put yourself in, in that state that you're wanting to feel, how do you want to feel? What are the, what are the feelings you're wanting to experience and put yourself in situations where you're more likely to have those feelings. Yeah. And, and doing like maybe even a quick, like a quick um, kind of body body scan where like if you're in a moment and you're, you're in your office let's say and you feel that anxiety surging you're feeling a certain way it's getting the best of you stop you know close the eyes deep breaths you know a few deep breaths and then just kind of sit there with your hands on your legs and feel your body feel the different sensations the little twitches you know what's going on in your body how does it feel to be there um nice sometimes that can help the mind settle down because you're actually calming the body so I mean, these are, I mean, there's plenty of other little tricks like that, but those are some of the ones we use. That's great. Deborah had a related question. She wanted to know how do you keep extremely strong negative thoughts out of your head? And I think the intensity of it matters. Like little things which are just kind of an annoyance, those are easy to deflect or to maybe um, reorient. But those extremely strong ones, just closing your eyes. And our, our friend Courtney Carver, too, I've actually started practicing this since she wrote it. 
as when you close your eyes, you know, feeling what is it my body is telling me right now, putting your hands over your heart is kind of an amazing thing that I've started doing when I'm feeling agitated or when there's these thoughts that I don't necessarily want to be in there. Mm -hmm. That has had a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another one here. So Tina has this question. She went through our pre-webinar worksheet and she says, how do you not let someone else's perception become your reality? How do you not let someone else's perception become your reality? Well, I mean, it's so easy, especially when people are being negative, right? They're, they're telling you something you don't want to hear. Um, you know, there's, there's so many ways to attack this question, but I'll attack it from this, from this standpoint. If there is somebody in your life that's telling you you can't do something, let's say it's somebody that you care about too. Let's say it's your mom. Your mom is telling you that you can't do something that, and she's not directly saying you're not good enough, but she's generally saying this is a bad move. Like, let's say you want to start a business, for instance. You have this idea to start a business, a computer business, and you're, you're getting this feedback from your mom that this isn't a good idea, that this is, that, you know, you, you're not good enough for this, that, that you're going to fail. And she's not saying it directly, but those, that's what she's insinuating. Um, one of the things, and this is something a lot of people talk about when, when you know, or this is a lot of, a lot of, something a lot of people struggle with. When negativity comes at you from family, from close that's friends, so like, what do you, how do you handle that? And one of the keys that we've talked about many times and we've kind of come to come to determine that you have to take a, you have to look at it a little bit more, a little bit bigger picture. So the first question is, do you think that this person is intentionally attacking what you want? Are they trying to attack you? And cause I, I think our, our, our natural emotional instinct is to say, yes, that's what we're thinking. Like my mom's attacking me. She doesn't want me to do this. She's being negative. She's hurting me. And that's usually not the case. What, what, what is happening is she's probably fearful herself. She has never started a business like that. She's done it differently. You're going against what she understands as being the way. And it, she's fearful for you, for your safety, for your well-being. So she's feeding you all this negativity based on her own fears, based on her own self-reflection of what is and isn't possible for you based on what she believes is possible, is or is not possible for herself. You know, so the question you need to ask yourself is, has this person who loves me, who cares about me, actually ever walked the path that I'm going to take? Have they started a similar business? Have they, have, have they been in my shoes, so, so to speak, and been walking this path before me? And if the answer is yes, well, then maybe there's something there to think about. There's at least maybe that person has some advice that will be beneficial to you as you progress down this road. It doesn't necessarily mean that every one of their opinions is correct, but maybe there is some, maybe their advice holds water. Maybe there's, there's something to listen to there. If the answer though is no, if, the per, if, if, if your mom has never walked that path before you, then there's a good chance that all of her commentary, all of her negativity is coming from her own fears. Mm -hmm. And Mark is speaking from experience because oh. this exact situation happened to us. You know, when we were ready to take the leap and work on marketingangel.com full time, our families were telling us, no, no, you need to stay at your nine to five jobs. You need a salary. You cannot, you can, it's not, you're not ready. It's too risky. Yeah. yeah there's too you many. You cannot do this. What about health insurance? What about this? And they just had all of these reasons why we should not do it. And it was a long list. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they, they were coming, they were, they were coming from a loving place, but to us, they weren't supporting us. And so when we started to realize like they know nothing about not working a nine to five job or being an entrepreneur. So they're just telling us their fears. They would never be an entrepreneur. They would never quit their steady paycheck to follow to a take passion, a risk, to, to, to take right. a risk. And so, when we realize that, like they're not telling us not to do it because they want to hurt us. They want to hurt us. They're telling us they that that they wouldn't do it. They're telling us that they have a fear. They would have never done that in their life. And so they were projecting that onto us. So when someone's giving you advice or someone's giving you that negativity or giving you suggestions, like Mark said, just to reiterate are they coming from a loving place or are they trying to be spiteful? And B, 
have they been in your shoes? Have they done this exact situation, this track that you're on? Do they have experience? And if they have experience, great. Thank you for giving me your advice and your feedback. I appreciate it. But if they haven't, then they're just speaking from their own fears. When you realize that, you start to not take it so personal. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. The, the differentiation between... It's so easy to ignore negativity coming from you know a, 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 an ex-coworker or something like that, but it's when it's coming from your family mm -hmm. or close friends on, on a larger level like that. I mean, it can, it can really wear thin on you. So yeah, I, I, I think this is something that a lot of people need to think about and need to practice. That's great. The same, hearing somebody say, don't do that, can often be, hey, I would never do that. Exactly. So I'm scared of you not doing that. I'm telling you to be scared because I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And we're able to see the difference between the two. Hey, we're, uh, we want to be respectful of people's time, uh, but there's a couple of other pretty nifty questions. Should we keep jamming, you two, or do you want to? Yeah, let's go a little longer. That's fine. All right. Bonus time. Bonus time, everybody. Uh, and this is kind of the converse of what we were just talking about. So the first one is having other people tell us um, and having that shape our perception. This other one is from Amy, and she talks about holding up the mirror. And she asked, why is it so much easier to hold up the mirror to other people and say, hey, your perception is not necessarily the reality or how most other people see the world. Here's how you might want to see it instead. So it's, I, I found this personally true as well in terms of holding up the mirror to someone else and be like, do you see this? Do you, do you see your reflection right here? This is a little bit different than how you're perceiving in your own head. Why is it so difficult? for us to hold up the mirror to ourselves and potentially a lot easier to hold up that mirror to other people. It's because of our thoughts. It's because of the way we feel about ourselves. That goes back to our self-esteem, our self-image. Um, our expectations. Our expectations of ourselves. Sometimes, especially when we are disappointed with ourselves, even subconsciously, it can be very hard to look in the mirror. It can be very hard to go through our thoughts using tools like self-inquiry. It can be very hard to ask ourselves those questions to literally do those brain dumps of our, those thoughts and really sit down and look at them and say, my gosh, that's what I'm thinking. And like, is this really true? And how is this making mm -hmm. me, how is this affecting my life? Mm -hmm. And who would I be if, it, if I wasn't constantly worrying about this? I, it's really hard to do that. And it's hard to do that every day. It's hard to make a ritual of that. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it's easier to look at somebody else and judge them instead of just judging ourselves. Mm -hmm. well, and um, it goes back to having like self-compassion and self-love, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there's that, that All saying, you know, if you had a friend talk to you the way you talk to yourself, would you still be friends with them? And just, just recently, you know, uh, we have a 13 month old son and he's, he's learning to walk and, you know, I'm constantly cheering him on. I'm so proud of you. You can do it. Try again. Keep going. And as I'm encouraging him, you know, I'm his biggest cheerleader. But it got me thinking, when was the last time I said these words to myself? And it's so true. We're, we're so hard on ourselves. And oftentimes, we're not our biggest cheerleader. So when I, I caught myself doing it, I was so, I, I, here I am encouraging, motivating my son, you know, he's failing and trying again and failing and trying again. But it really was like, wow, when was the last time I told myself, I love you, keep going, I'm proud of you, you can do it, it's okay. And so it really got me thinking, like, when you catch yourself praising somebody else, ask yourself, when was the last time I did this for myself and then start implementing it? Yeah. And that can go right. That can tie right back into the whole idea of a gratitude journal or mm -hmm. gratitude meditation, where at least you're celebrating your small wins on a day-to-day -day basis as a ritual, as something that you just do every single day. And um, yeah, I mean that 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 almost takes care of that by default mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, well, let's do one more. And actually, there's a combination. So Z, Luna, and Amy have uh, questions that seem like they're somewhat business oriented, but also about that abundance mindset that we were talking about previously. Um, when it, achieving your long-term goals while staying present, some of those seem to be at odds, at least on the face. And Mark, I think you talked about that a little bit, is getting present is so that you can take action, so that you can move on with intentionality and with purpose um, to do your actions. But Amy's question is, is pretty specific here. And she says, while I agree personally with the abundance mindset, how do I reconcile that with my business and wanting to grow that? So there's the conflict, that tension between I am enough, I am good enough, but also I want more for my business, I want more for my impact and helping other people. How do you two reconcile that seemingly competing uh, interest of 
being good with what you got and also wanting to impact more. Well, no, this ties right into what we sort of spoke on already, and that is I'm good enough for what I have to do today. It's not I'm good enough and I'm just going to sit here because I'm good enough. It's I'm good enough for what has to be done today. I'm going to be mindful, not so I can just sit here and smile, but so that I can get to a place where I can attack the work that needs to be done today in the most effective manner I possibly can. Being mindful, feeling good enough in the moment is the groundwork for taking focused action. So, I mean, that's the key. The key is the ritual of being present with what you are currently working on and then when the task is completed, letting it go so you're not attached to it and moving on to the next thing that you need to do. So there is, there is some shifts there. You know, it, it, it is about, you know, I, I've said this so many times. I think that when it comes to achieving big goals like running a business, you know, Angel and I have gone through a lot of, a lot of challenges with that. Um, it is easy to get helter-skelter. It is easy to, to not be present and to always be thinking about the next thing that needs to be done. The two, the two things you need to realize is, one, that's not going to work. And two, if you have too many things on your plate, and we sort of touched on this already, but if you have too many things on your plate, you're not going to get any one of them done correctly. So if you're not being mindful with the things you do, then you're just sort of doing them, but you're not really getting them done properly. So it, it, it's about being focused, being mindful, mindful on the current task, mm -hmm. on, the pres on, the, on the task at hand, but not staying there with it forever, right? Working on it until it's done mm -hmm. or until it's at the point that you feel it's time to move on to the next task for the day. And then never having, like, another big mistake with businesses, especially small businesses that we used to make that so many people make is, you know, they'll, they'll, they have, like, literally a list that's pages long of to-do list tasks for a day. Like, there's, you know, today I have, like, 25 things I need to do. Well, you're never going to really accomplish, if, especially if there are 25 bigger things, you're never going to accomplish those 25 things well. You're not going to accomplish them at all. Thinking that you can is only going to stress you out. So, you know, going back to eliminate, you know, focus on what's most important, eliminate everything else, that's for the day. Focus on what's most important today and eliminate what's, what everything else for today. You know, so, and you should be left with maybe three to five core tasks, mm -hmm. three to five big tasks for the day. Any more than that, and you're not going to be truly effective. So, you know, it's certainly there's little things, right? So when I say core tasks, I don't mean tie your shoes, drop the kids off at school, pick up groceries, you know, fix, figure out what you're eating for dinner. Those are small tasks that can be batched together, right? You know, drop the kids off at school, pick up the groceries on the way back. Like you can batch those things in time slots, hopefully in certain parts of your day where it's not affecting your actual work. Um, but for big tasks, like, you know, today I need to write an intro for a new book I'm writing, right? I need to get started on that. That's one task for the day, you know, and you should, like I said, no more than three to five of those because otherwise it's too much and you won't be effective. Mm. Well, I'm channeling a lot of the comments that I'm seeing here on Twitter and on uh, the Google Plus event page. There, there's some seriously new perspective that people are gaining uh, and it's just very practical specific tools and techniques that you two have given. Just to, to recap on what I'm seeing here, so untrue thoughts, which is where we started, and self-compassion. Um, Inner pressure and outer neg negativity that's stopping you from having that simple, intentional life. We covered a serious amount of ground. And I know some people are maybe frantically scratching notes, or maybe they didn't get to watch this live, or their internet connection cut in and out. I just want to mention to everybody that we will be emailing the link to the replay. It's going to be up on YouTube. That'll be coming in the next 24 hours. Um, and you'll also be able to watch the replay on simplerev.com on our webinar page. That's simplerev.com slash M-A-A -A webinar. That'll also be up there in about 24 hours. Morgan Angel, I know the two of us, this won't be the end of our conversation, but for everybody else, and for the, it's super cool to see people engaging each other and to build each other up and also help each other in the comments, we want to keep that chatter going with your fellow participants, wherever it may happen to be. We're not looking to dictate it. Wherever Mark and Angel hang out online, which is seemingly everywhere, you two <laughs> you clearly aren't doing everything by yourselves and have systematized things to a certain extent. I'm impressed. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for contributing as much as you have and for giving us a little bit of bonus time. For the folks who aren't familiar with you and don't know where you generally hang out online, where can folks find more from you two? 
Well, the easiest place is markandangel.com. So M-A-R-C and angel.com. Um, we try to engage with our audience as much as possible in the comments there. Um, you know, for a deeper dive, obviously we have a course and for those people we get on, on Skype, all of our course students get Skype phone interaction. So if you have like some serious things you want to talk about one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you can also find that right through our blog at markandangel.com. Cool. Very cool. Well, thank you too. Again, I'm seriously grateful for the time that you've carved out for us. Um, all of our participants, thank you for leaving comments, sending tweets, interacting with each other, asking questions for the Q&A. Uh, that's a wrap for now, but this certainly is not the end of the conversation. Appreciate everybody joining us and contributing so much.